Okay, I hope it is recording. Yeah, I think it is recording. Okay. Welcome everybody for our uh, weekly seminar series at the Department of Marine Geosciences. Uh, we're very proud to host uh, Professor Babette Hugaker from Heriot Watt uh, University in the UK. Professor Babette Hugaker is a paleoclimate scientist. She currently focuses on understanding how seawater oxygen concentrations have changed in the geological past and how this can help us predict what happened in the future. Before joining Harriet Watts uh, University in Edinburgh, Babette uh, uh, was a postdoctoral fellow funded by the UK Natural Environmental Research Council, NERC, at the University of Oxford, and a postdoctor postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. She obtained her PhD from the University of Southampton. So uh, today, as they say, we are very honored, and Babette is going to talk about changes in ocean, in ocean oxygen content, how the past can inform the future. So thank you very much. The podium is yours. Thank you, Nico. So uh, Nico and I know each other from uh, way back in Oxford, and Nico was doing stalagmites, and I was starting work on this. I'm, are you still doing work on stalagmites, or have you oh, late, late diversified? Late. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to give the seminar. Um, so yes, over the last mm, 15 years, I've been trying to uh, specialize my research in looking at uh, dissolved oxygen concentration in the ocean. Um, and I've got a, a lovely group of people that are working with me. Um, so I've put their names all here. So some people are uh, also paleoclimate uh, data gatherers uh, using proxy methods. And uh, um, there's also some modelers in my group now. So because of global warming, um, oxygen concentrations in the oceans are uh, changing as well. And we want to be able to know more about how this might uh, you know, continue and, and what, what direction this is going to be in. So a lot of my research is basically looking at um, how uh, reconstructions from the past can help us inform uh, what might happen in the future. So just to give you a little bit of a, an overview of the seminar today, first I will give a, an introduction with motivation, then I will introduce some of the proxies that can be used to reconstruct oxygen levels. Um, and then uh, I think actually number three I've taken out today. I'm sorry I didn't um, change that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Fargo project and uh, some um, results that we found about iodine cycling in the ocean. So apologies to seven our contents are not completely up to date. So to understand um, oxygen in seawater and also in, in the atmosphere, first we need to know how oxygen is produced. You probably all know that this is through uh, plant photosynthesis, where you've got CO2 and water and nutrients and sunlight uh, forming organic material and then oxygen. So obviously the terrestrial biosphere and is a big contributor of oxygen uh, to our atmosphere. And um, the same goes for phytoplankton in the ocean. So there's a saying that probably about every third breath you take is created by uh, photosynthesis of phytoplankton in the oceans, basically, whereas the other two thirds are coming um, from terrestrial vegetation. But then oxygen is used up again as well in the reverse reaction of photosynthesis. So that's basically just remineralization where the organic material previously formed is degraded using um, mainly oxygen and that then produces CO2 and releases the nutrients and the energy. Um, so if we look, uh, if we compare with oxygen uh, in the atmosphere and in the ocean, uh, there's a big difference. Obviously, the, the atmosphere has got about 21%. Oxygen in the ocean is less than 1%. Um, but still, a lot of marine life depends on oxygen. Most marine life is aerobic and needs some sort of some, you know, needs dissolved oxygen in seawater to be able to survive. 
Um, now, a couple of facts about dissolved oxygen in seawater. So it's highly, how much oxygen can dissolve in seawater is highly dependent on temperature. So on with low temperatures, we can have quite high dissolved oxygen concentrations. And you can see with increasing seawater temperatures, uh, it reduces quite a lot. But in addition to temperature, salinity also has a good effect. And you can see here, if you change salinity from 30 to 36, while you keep temperature constant, that the dissolved oxygen content decreases as well. So these are two kind of uh, natural processes that um, influence dissolved oxygen in seawater. Now, so oxygen, so you might be aware that, you know, gases take time to equilibrate with the sea surface. So for oxygen, uh, that takes about one month. Uh, whereas if you compare it with atmospheric CO2, it's about 12 months. Um, so, but there's still different areas in the ocean where oxygen can be super saturated and undersaturated, basically. So just a, a, a bit of an overview of how our oceans and atmosphere have become oxygenated um, over you know, the history of the earth. Um, so we have about 2.4 billion years ago, there was the kind of great oxidation event where the, the atmosphere was uh, becoming oxygenated and also um, shallow waters um, had locally some, some oxygen basically. And then it's not until kind of 500 million years ago that the, you know, the atmosphere became fully oxygenated and that the, the deep ocean also became oxygenated. So that, that's actually quite a, a recent uh, kind of phenomenon if you think in geological timescales. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at dissolved oxygen um, at different water depths, we see some interesting features. So we have got here uh, dissolved oxygen at um, zero meters water depth. And in pink, basically, you have really high oxygen. And in blue, you have low. So you can see that in the cold areas, in the polar areas, uh, where you also have a bit more fresh water, we can see that we got really high dissolved oxygen uh, values there. Now, if we go a little bit deeper in the ocean and we go to 2,000 meters, then we see a big difference. We see that most of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean have really low oxygen values. And then in the North Atlantic, we still have some high oxygen values. And you can see just around uh, Antarctica, there is some areas as well where we have um, high oxygen. Then if we go even deeper at four kilometers, then again, we see that the Pacific, North Pacific and Indian Ocean have lower oxygen concentrations, but then in the North Atlantic and in the South Southern Ocean, we find some higher oxygen concentrations. So what causes these low oxygen uh, concentrations in deeper basins and why is there these differences between basins? Now, this can all be related to the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So we see it here the role that convection has in deep water formation in the Nordic seas and around Antarctica in keeping the ocean ventilated, basically. So we have deep water formation going on in the Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian seas, um, and then intermediate water formation in the Labrador Sea. And then around Antarctica, there's some areas where you have deep water formation. So this profile here shows you dissolved oxygen concentration going from the North Atlantic to the Southern Ocean, and then to the Pacific. And along this pathway, so you can see that you get slowly start to get a decrease in dissolved oxygen concentrations. But what you also see that there are two zones um, that you go through. So that's one about uh, here and the other one in the Pacific, where we get really low oxygen concentrations. So these are areas that kind of typically on the eastern side of a basin, uh, which are very poorly ventilated. So these are areas where we have quite a bit of upwelling and high productivity. Um, and then at that, all this kind of organic material is being remineralized. And because it's not being replenished by 
um, high oxygen waters, uh, we get oxygen deficient zones, basically. So we find them in areas of sluggish ocean circulation and, and very poor ventilation. So ocean deficient zone are there naturally. Um, and also if you kind of, uh, for example, especially if you go in the Pacific, um, if you just go uh, just above them, there's, th these are areas of high productivity because these, um, you know, once it's oxidized, it releases a lot of nutrients and things like that for the animal life above it. But in the areas where we have like really low oxygen concentrations, this is uh, quite bad for marine life. Um, so we know that medium um, lethal oxygen concentrations for crustaceans and fishes are between about 40 and 60 micromoles per kilogram. Um, and then for bivalves and gastropod, um, it becomes a bit lower. And then there's also like different thresholds that different uh, species have, and also you know times that they might be able to survive on the low oxygen concentrations. Now, obviously, uh, some species that are, can be quite mobile that can move away from low oxygen uh, waters um, are a bit safer. But uh, for you know, if you're kind of living on the sea floor and you can't move a lot, if you kind of get immersed in low oxygen waters, then that's bad news for you. Now, like I mentioned before, um, because of global warming, our oceans have started to lose oxygen. So the German colleagues have kind of made an, an average calculation for that. And they've shown that since 1960, the oceans have lost about 2% of their dissolved oxygen content. Um, and you can see that it's last vast areas of the South Atlantic, and, and also in the Pacific and in the Arctic. In addition to kind of average ocean low oxygen concentra uh, oxygen concentrations going lower, um, the ocean dis oxygen deficient zones have been expanding. So in yellow, you can. So this is uh, my very poor uh, coloring in. But in yellow, we have got oxygen concentrations between 1960 and 1974. And then in red is where it's expanded uh, between 1990 and 2008, basically. Um, so there's several reasons why the oxygen concentrations are becoming lower. Um, so one is because seawater is getting warmer. So that just means you can't not dissolve as much oxygen most oxygen as she could when it was cooler. The other is in relation to, um, you know, slowdown of the overturning circulation. So by melting sea ice and having the Arctic more stratified, that means there might there's likely to be reduction in the overturning circulation that is also going to influence um, and cause a reduction in ocean uh, ventilation and things like that. So models, climate models have predicted that oxygen concentrations will continue to reduce uh, in the future. So you've got here the, the different scenarios where I see RC, so this is kind of from 2013. So RCP 8.5 is kind of the more like uh, scenario as usual. Um, and so we've got uh, by 2100 predictions of uh, result decreases between uh, two and 4%. Now, if you remember the work from Schmidt at all suggests that oceans actually already lost 2%. So that means that the models are not really capturing the, the loss um, that currently is happening very well. And it needs some improvements basically. Um, so there's various reasons that there could be these model mismatches, what, uh, which are summarized in, in Andreas Oshley's paper. Uh, some are relating to unresolved transport processes, unaccounted variations in respiratory oxygen demand, and also some missing uh, feedback mechanisms. So, but one thing that came out of this paper as well is that we need to better understand how oxygen contents um, have changed on longer time scales. And so one way to do that is by continuing observations, obviously um, at the pace that we're going, 
you know, with one year at a time, we, it goes quite slowly. And so another way is to look at uh, reconstructing oxygen levels in, and drivers of the changes in the past, basically. And that's where um, my research comes in. So what insights could we learn from past uh, seawater oxygen reconstructions? So obviously here we're looking at natural variability and we're looking at uh, much longer time scales and forcings um, because with, with most kind of uh, proxy reconstructions, we're looking at um, sediment samples that maybe cover a, a time period. Um, if you're lucky, it's a hundred years, but most times it's probably just about a, a thousand or something like that. So you don't really get into annual variability and things like that. So there's a couple of time periods in the geological past that might be quite uh, good for trying to understand how you know our oceans uh, will respond to further climate change. Um, one is by looking at ocean anoxic events. Uh, so these are times of prolonged warming and high CO2. And this is when we found uh, deposits with kind of um, you know anoxic clays and stuff like that and high organic material. Um, another uh, period to look at is like recent interglacials. So we have got over the last uh, 800,000 years, we've got a lot of information from um, ice cores and we can also use uh, models to kind of get to orbital forcings. So we can see when we have different temp temperature anomalies during mar different marine um, interglacials, marine isotope stages one, five, seven, nine, and so forth. And then we can contrast these um, for different periods. Another uh, interesting period to look at is glacial periods. Um, so these are periods when there was huge changes in the ocean carbon sink and also in ocean uh, ventilation. So um, these are always kind of good times to look at as well, to kind of look at what boundary conditions and, and forcings are, are working. And it's a very good, if you, you know, can get a, a model to get the glacials right, then, you know, it's a good, good way to kind of test it. Um, but then obviously uh, we're looking at climate that's gonna be warmer and different in, in the future. Um, so there's different time periods that you can look at then as well. So one is the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, and other one is climate uh, of the Miocene, the Miocene uh, climate optimum. Now those two periods are associated with quite different continental configurations and ocean circulation, so they're not really that good of a comparison perhaps. Uh, the Pliocene is a time period when uh, the continental configurations were quite uh, similar to today and also ocean bathymetry and things like that. So um, this is one of the periods that we are currently uh, working on. So in my, over my um, career, I, I've started working on changes in oxygen concentrations during glacial periods. And then for the last, say, five years, uh, we've been looking at uh, the Pliocene um, and also recent interglacials. And we've actually also been looking at the using oxygen reconstructions to pinpoint when uh, the Panama Isthmus uh, basically emerged, basically, uh, because that had big implications for uh, Pacific Ocean uh, ventilation and oxygenation. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my current uh, project that I'm working on. So that's Fate of Ocean Oxygenation in a Warming World. Um, and I've managed to abbreviate it to Fargo because that, that was a film that I watched when I was uh, a bit younger. And I've recently watched a series as well. And that's quite uh, hard actually. But um, yes, the aim for this project is to improve our understanding of the ocean oxygen cycle. And um, what we want to learn is uh, how sensitive the Pacific Ocean is to, to warming. So the Pacific Ocean today is the lowest uh, dissolved, has the lowest dissolved oxygen concentrations, and is also uh, currently um, getting most of the expansions and stuff like that. We want to learn more about drivers of changes in oxygen concentrations in a warmer world, 
and then use these uh, observations during production to improve predictions of future ocean oxygen concentrations. So we do this due, through a combination of proxy reconstructions and modeling, basically. So one time period that we looked at is the closure of the American Seaway. Another time period is the mid Pliocene warm period. That's kind of a very interesting period because um, this is where we seem to be going for, uh, for the year 2100, where the Arctic is most likely going to be ice free. And then we're also looking at uh, recent interglacials of the last uh, 0.8 million years. Now, for these uh, reconstructions, um, we'll use proxy methods. So this is a very nice image that was put together by Katrina, uh, which shows you like a sediment core and then lots of different proxy methods that you could be using to reconstruct dissolved oxygen. Um, so we have got uh, laminations that can be an indicator of low oxygen because of lack of bioturbation. Uh, people have looked at benthic foraminifera assemblages, redox uh, sensitive metals. Um, something I've, I've recently uh, put together is looking at the carbon isotope gradient between two uh, benthic foraminifera species. Um, people have used nitrogen isotopes as an indication of denitrification. And recently, planktonic foraminifera iodine calcium ratios have also come up as a a nice and interesting proxy. Now, on top, so these are kind of proxies that uh, have been going on for the last couple of years, but then recently there's been quite uh, an, an expansion in different proxies that are there. And so there's also, you can look at uh, morphology of benthic foraminifera, specifically uh, the pore contents that seems to be very uh, well correlated to. Um, oxygen concentrations in seawater. Uh, people have been developing biomarkers. Um, and then for nitrogen isotopes, they can also be found and analyzed bound to forums and diatoms. And it's quite interesting because there's quite a difference between bulk sediments and forams, um, with bulk sediments sometimes um, being subject to diagenesis, basically. And then finally, there's also some suggestions about planktonic from different assemblages and morphologies. So if you're ever bored <laughs> and you find this interesting, then you can have a look at this paper in review. It's a bit of a, uh, it's a book almost. Um, it's about a hundred pages, um, but it, re it really gives an overview of all the different proxies that people have been using for the Cenozoic um, to kind of help if anybody wanting to go on it on this mission to kind of have an idea of what's out there basically. So in today's talk, I want to focus a little bit about planktonic foraminifera iodine calcium ratios. So, so planktonic foraminifera, oh, wait. So let's first just go talk, first I'm just gonna introduce iodine in seawater. So, because iodine is basically what we look for in planktonic foraminifera as well. So there's two stable forms of iodine. One is the iodate, which is the IO3. That's the oxidized form of iodate, iodine. And then there's iodide. Now here are some stations from just of Japan showing you how much iodide and iodate there is. So iodate is this one here, about 0.4 uh, micromoles per liter. And here's the iodide. And you can see that in all of these profiles, when you go deeper down, they're all around the same number. Um, but then in this, very much in the surface, you can see some differences. So that's the influence of biology, basically, on, on the kind of speciation of iodine in seawater. Now, if you go to the, so like I mentioned before, we have a, an oxidized form and we have a reduced form. Now, if we move to the East Pacific, where we have a very strong oxygen minimum zone. Um, so here's, this is a profile that was taken from there. Um, then we kind of see that it's a slightly different picture. So he, this figure in the top here shows you the, sorry, shows you the oxygen concentrations along this transact. So you have like high oxygen in the mixed layer and then below that it becomes really low, it's below uh, 15. 
then we can see if we look at iodide, so that is the reduced form, we can see that's quite a bit of that around and it's quite high in the kind of lower oxygen uh, circuit. Uh, and then even more interesting, if you look at iodate, so that's the oxidized form, we can see that that is practically almost zero everywhere. That's really low in these low oxygen waters, basically. So if we kind of summarize these observations, then we could have, you know, and so we have here on the left-hand side, oxygen profiles of areas where we have low oxygen waters. And here we have an, a profile of a kind of high oxygen water. Then in the right-hand side here, we get the iodate profile. So on the right in normal ocean, uh, iodide, iodate is kind of about 0.45. So this is a profile from the Weddell Sea, which is well oxygenated. But then if you look at the Arabian Sea and the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, we see that iodate goes almost to zero, basically. Now, the, there's been uh, some suggestions that reduction of iodate to iodide might happen between 20 to 70 micromole per kilogram. Um, some people suggest it might actually be lower than that, it might actually be less than 10. Um, and then one really important observation that kind of spearheaded this proxy into existence is some inorganic carbon precipitation experiments where basically the, the author uh, supersaturated um, um, a solution with carbonate and, a, and, a, and distinct iodate uh, concentrations and also did some experiments with iodide and they found that only iodate is being incorporated in the calcite so that suggests that iodate might be uh, replacing uh, carbonate iron or something like that. Now this is obviously an inorganic carbon uh, precipitation experiment and um, if this kind of works in nature as well then iodine calcium in foraminifera, including planktonic foraminifera, could hold clues about the redox state in the upper water column. So in case if you're not familiar uh, with foraminifera, uh, so these are single-celled microorganisms that have web-like pseudopedia. Um, and we have two kind of uh, sorts, uh, some that can float in the surface water, so they're called planktonic, and some that are called and that live on top of the seafloor or in sediments, and they are called benthic. And what is important is that, oh, sorry, that, uh, hold on. Yeah, so they basically, uh, there's a lot of them that make carbonate shells. And when they form these shells, when they, when they are alive, they basically record the information from the environment uh, that they're calcified in. And um, what is also really important about planktonic foraminifera and, and if, if, you know, for this proxy uh, would really help us to expand in to the more open ocean to look at lo dissolved oxygen concentrations, because a lot of the proxies are basically based in the sediments and they kind of reconstruct the bottom water. So if you want to know whether there's an oxygen minimum, so you have to be in that location to kind of test for that, whereas um, if planktic foraminifera could give us information about low oxygen waters, then we could go much further in the open ocean because, you know, after they uh, die, they, they fall to the sea floor, and we could still kind of capture um, subsurface water conditions there. Right. Um, so this figure here on the left shows you the iodate profiles again from in, in seawater. So here we have a normal open ocean profile with high iodate. And then in the ocean, in the ocean so there should be ODZ, <laughs> uh, ocean deficient uh, zone type, we get these really low iodate profiles. Um, so what we did in 2016 is we got loads of uh, core top samples from uh, different places around the world. Um, six from the Atlantic, one from the Indian Ocean, one from the Southern Ocean, and two from the Pacific. And we measured the 
iodine calcium ratios in planktic foraminifera. So these are all the different species um, that we analyze basically. And we see a, quite an interesting pattern here. So on the right hand side and in the top, we have uh, quite high um, iodine calcium values. And these are all locations that are today uh, characterized by well oxygenated uh, waters basically. Then on the left hand side, we have got um, lowering um, iodine calcium ratios. And especially if we look at 1242, so these are ODP sites, 1242 and 720, we get really low um, iodine calcium ratios. So that kind of brought us to think that um, this could be a good proxy to reconstruct um, dissolved oxygen in subsurface waters. And we published a couple of papers about that. Um, so I'm a curious person, and um, as you can see here, it says basically minimum oxygen concentrations, and these kind of oxygen concentrations can vary in the ocean. And I'm always a bit kind of, I was wondering, you know, why is this? How come um, do we get these values? So on top of kind of trying to expand on this, we also did some plankton tow work at some point. Uh, first shows you show you like an expansion of the core top um, work. So this is a work that's been done by Helge Winkelbauer uh, for his PhD thesis. So this map here shows you all the locations where he's done his research. Uh, in green, we have locations where uh, we have found Holocene. So these are Holocene samples, then uh, triangles are non-Holocene and, and axis means that there's no form in Ifra. Um, so in terms of uh, available iodine calcium data, it's kind of uh, plugged some important gaps. And so here Helga's data are plotted on top of data uh, by uh, Lou et al. Uh, 2016 and also 2022. And you can see is you still got the same kind of pattern with high values uh, for well oxygenated waters and then lower values for low oxygenated waters. So how does it work, right? So we basically assume that planktonic formulae for iodine calcium ratios are a function of the dissolved iodate content in the seawater. Now, so like I mentioned before, we also kind of decided to go out and take some plankton tow samples and do seawater um, iodate measurements at the same time. So that's plotted here. So we've got iodine calcium values of the foraminifera on the y-axis, and we have dissolved iodate in the x-axis. Then we have got uh, locations, uh, Banguela. So this is the Banguela upwelling, where there is you know, still reasonable oxygen concentrations. Then we've got Drake Passage, very high oxygenated, uh, North Atlantic, well oxygenated, and then we've got the Northeast Pacific, basically. So the, uh, and what we see is kind of quite interesting is that there is not really a, a strong relationship with iodine calcium and dissolved iodate at all. Now there could be different reasons uh, for this. Um, you know, and some might have argued that, you know, these are just time snapshots and maybe these are not the kind of, would have not been the same samples that went to the, the, the sea floor. But I think there's a bit more than that. I think there's actually something happening uh, to the foraminifera basically. So I think, I hope you agree with me that this limited figure suggests that there, it's not a straightforward relationship between planktonic foraminifera, iodine calcium and, and iodate in seawater basically. We're going to do some more analysis from different locations and stuff like that for from plankton toes, but I think it's an it's an important observation. So if we plot this on top of all the core tops, um, we see kind of an interesting kind of uh, development as well. So we get we do get the lowest iodine calcium values in really low oxygen waters, but you can see that uh, over here all the plankton toes are. You know, have really low iodine calcium ratios, um, whereas uh, the core tops are much higher. So you could say that, you know, core tops in well oxygenated waters have got uh, iodine calcium values that are about 10 times higher. 
Um, and that to me suggests that the planktic formula for iron calcium ratios that uh, are found in, in, the, in the core tops in these well oxygenated settings, I don't know about the not so oxygenated settings, but in these well oxygenated settings, <coughs> it might not be just a pure um, subsurface uh, water signal. Um, I, just, I don't know what happened here. So just to conclude, because I realize not that much time left. So just to conclude is that we have uh, two stable forms of iodine in seawater, um, iodate and, and iodide, and that total concentration is about uh, 0.45 micromoles per liter, and that doesn't really seem to change. Um, according to the core top kind of studies, you would suggest, we would suggest that you know, iodate reduces to iodide when oxygen concentrations are below 20 to 70 micromoles per kilogram. And the inorganic carbon precipitation experiments suggest that only iodate is incorporated in calcite. But then if we compare in situ iodate measurements and planktonic formaldehyde iodine calcium ratios from TOES, we find that these are quite low. And then in, in, in high oxygen settings, we find core top values that are much higher, which would suggest that, uh, so I think is that when the foraminifera settle to the water column or when they're buried in the sediments, they're actually gaining um, some iodine then basically. Um, so then just kind of highlight that, you know, this is a whole team that's been working with this. So these are all the people that kind of been working in my group. Um, and those are cute little foraminifera that are part of some of our outreach activities. Um, and also, we recently developed a PAGES working group on past ocean oxygenation, PO2. And if you want to inv get involved, you can get in touch with me or you can just go on PAGES and you can subscribe uh, to the working group to find out about, you get the newsletters and also get invited to workshops and stuff like that. Um, and that's the end of my talk. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to hear them. Thank you, Babette. Great. You can hear me, right? I can hear you, yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, so if somebody in the Zoom or in the class have any questions? Okay, in the Zoom, somebody? Okay, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I I wondered you you show that as the temperature of the of the seawater of the surface seawater increases and the and the salinity increases, you have less dissolved oxygen, right? Yeah. And is there a, a, a parameter that also like the, what is the exchange rate with the atmosphere and how does that affect the amount of dissolved oxygen that you have in the ocean? I'm trying to understand if it's a uh, phenomena that is, uh, is related also to ocean atmosphere interaction or only a sol solely or solely or a, a surface water? Um, no, it is. I mean, the, um, so you have the surface, uh, you, 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 there's an there's equilibration of the water with the, the atmosphere. And obviously, because water is being mixed and things like that, it takes about one month. But um, obviously, if you have phytoplankton, um, uh, photosynthesizing that will also create a uh, dissolved oxygen in the seawater and some of that will escape to the atmosphere but in those areas you can find supersaturated uh, conditions whereas for example um, in areas where um, there's a lot of mixing and you don't have that happening then you can have some more under saturation and stuff like that okay i have a question mm -hmm. <clears throat> um First of all, thank you for a great uh, talk. Very interesting, and uh, even for a geophysicist like me. <laughs> uh, you showed that, the, and, and maybe I'm getting confused with the terminology, but the, the, it is the iod date that the, that that or the iodate to to calcium that uh, remains low. Yeah. And and the question is. 
should we only look for the effect in the iodate or, or is there an effect in the calcium that may, that may be associated with that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, so my, my gut instinct is that it could be, um, that there's a diagenetic so basically when four and if after they die and they and they sink to the water column they get they develop or even during nematogenesis they develop crusts and things like that um so those and, and when they sink to the water column they can add to that i don't know if you've ever like i i remember um, harry elderfield he, he sometimes went out with jonathan eris in the red sea and just if you put a bottle out or something like that and pick that up, you just get like calcite um, precipitating on that already, basically. Um, so you, you have that effect. But um, when you get to the, the sea floor, there's all sorts of pro processes going on of mixing and things like that. And I think there's another area where there is potentially, um, you know, where more calcite can be added, uh, depending on what the situation is. Um, and if those are kind of, better oxygenated areas and maybe that's one reason that you get the higher iodine calcium or maybe it's because it's uh, not biological the diagenetic uh, it's a different kind of mechanism for precipitation calcite uh, could be one of the reasons why it has these higher higher values um the yeah i mean with a lot of not with everything but but quite a few things you can you find that when you look at plankton toes and you look at what you find in the sediments that there's sometimes differences so Thank you. Maybe you should come to the Mediterranean. Here, preservation is immense. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, really. I mean, you you get amazing pre preservation here. So maybe uh -huh. at the seafloor. So maybe it's a good place to test it again. Yeah. So uh, I've actually been working with uh, Maya Moitadi from uh, Angers. So mm -hmm. we worked on the line on the Nile on the on the last ten thousand years, um, and they actually have really low iodine calcium ratios. So that could be. And, and they look really well preserved. So that could be an indication that that's probably an area where it works quite well. I've worked for my PhD, I worked in the Western Mediterranean. And there the forearms are a bit more calcified as well and stuff like that. So. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, thank you, Babette. It was a very interesting talk. I think the students learned a lot. And uh, we hope to see you one day here uh, in nice. a real talk. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the thing is, like, um, we, with, with the Fargo project, you know, with, with the, the closing of the Panama Isthmus and the Pliocene and things like that, we're getting all these results now. And in the next couple of months in the year, we will have lots of new new results and data and stuff like that as well um, right. for the for the bigger picture things but I'm, I'm hoping that the students enjoyed learning a little bit about the journey about developing a proxy and that sometimes it doesn't always work and things like that as well so yeah sure sure thank you very much okay so bye 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 thank you bye see you all next week bye bye